Good evening. I'm Sherry Kumar of the Tesla Science Foundation, and I would like to introduce you to our next speaker. The ideas presented up to this point have opened dialogue about energy and innovation. But it's not enough to acknowledge today's visionaries and talk about the future. It's very important to discuss how to inspire young minds when they're just learning how to think. Our next guest is an independent researcher, public speaker, and a radio talk show host. He has been a vocal activist on the subject of Tesla and free energy. Today, to kick off our segment on education, he will talk about who was so influential to take Tesla out of schools. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the always outspoken Mark Passio. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. And I want to thank Nick Lonchar and the Tesla Science Foundation for inviting me to speak here today. I'm going to get up here and say the things that no one else will say. So get ready. And you know what? When you say things like I'm about to say today, a lot of people tend to get a little bit upset because they may not be ready to hear the truths that I'm about to speak here today. Well, ask anybody who knows me and they'll tell you I'm going to say them anyway. So let's get started. My presentation is entitled Free Energy, From Suppression to Manifestation? Question mark. You know, this technology has been suppressed for well over 100 years. Is it going to manifest? I don't know. That remains to be seen. That remains to be determined. My website is right here. Please do check it out. It's called whatonearthishappening.com. There's a tremendous body of knowledge available at that website. The greatest inventor, perhaps, who ever lived. I think everyone in the room would agree with that statement. But some of the questions we don't usually get into is, how was it even possible at all for the name of the greatest inventor who ever lived to be historically marginalized? How was that even possible to do? Okay. Another question I'm going to attempt to answer is, who would have been so influential and powerful that they could have accomplished this? Okay? And then, of course, why was this done? I think we all have kind of a pretty good idea of this question. Why was it done? And then in the second half of the presentation, I'm going to talk about what is going to be required on the part of humanity. What are we going to need to change within ourselves, within our own psychological makeup, within our own spirituality, if we're ever going to realize the most visionary technologies which Tesla planned to implement? And again, some people may not like what they're about to hear. This slide that I'm going to build here may be the most important slide you will ever see in any presentation. I call it how our reality is built. It's a truth discovery methodology. Down here, you have knowledge. This block represents available information, which constitutes potential knowledge that may be gathered, processed, understood, and then acted upon by individuals in our society. On top of that knowledge, or again, I, over here, you'll see I've put, or lack thereof, okay, knowledge or ignorance, okay, you have an understanding of that information, again, or lack thereof. These are the decision-making processes that each one of us uses, and they are dependent upon the knowledge that we either have or do not have. So these processes take place in the human mind and are chosen by each individual based upon the available information that they take into themselves. Above that, something happens externally. Okay? We put our knowledge and our decision-making processes into action in the world through our behavior. Okay? And that I call wisdom or lack thereof. 
Okay? So each individual's behavior is based upon the quality of their decision-making processes, which again in turn are based upon the quality of the, their available information that they've taken into themselves. This three-step process, okay, was in the ancient world referred to as the trivium. That's a Latin term. It means the three ways, the three methods. It's a threefold process of truth discovery. And it's been eradicated from the modern world. Eradicated. Okay? Real education in the past taught the trivium methodology. Now, so-called educators don't even know the trivium at all. They've never even heard of it. Okay? So, what happens above that? After human behavior, we get the result, right? We get what actually manifests in reality. So that's the generated result. The conclusion, the manifestation, it's what happens, it's what occurs in our world, okay? The quality of the condition which manifests in any given society is going to be based upon the aggregate quality of behavior within that society. That determines what our world is like. All right? Now, if you were of a mindset, just let's say, so to speak, to try to control that outcome, what level would you want to control things from? So here's how to control reality if you're of that mindset, and there are many people who are, are you gonna to try to control it from the level of manifestation? Well, I think that's pretty impossible, right? Because it's already occurred, it already manifested. You're not gonna control it from that level, so we could take that out of the equation. Are you gonna control it from the human behavioral level? I mean physically, people's physical behavior, you're gonna to try to control that in each individual? Well, you could, you know, but that's called overt control. And people see that pretty readily, right? And they'll rebel against that pretty quickly because they'll know they're under control. So that's going to be the most difficult place to control that from. Can you control it from people's decision-making processes, meaning from the level of mind? Yes, you absolutely can. But that's actually more difficult because you have to go to each individual and you would have to try to change the way that they think. Instead, the most effective way to control reality is to control it from this base level, available information, because that's the level all the other manifested realities are built upon. So if you can control that, you control the whole game, and you control behavior, and therefore you control the outcome. Okay? So we're going to look at how Tesla's name was actually removed from education, from schools. How was that done? How was that accomplished? Okay? Because if you're going to control available information, you have to have some level of control over educational institutions that are teaching children, allegedly. So where are you going to control that from? Are you going to control it from each institutional body? Would that be effective? I don't think that would be very effective. I think the best place, if you are of a mindset to try to control what is going to be taught to our children, would be to control the books. Okay? And when you control the books, which is the available information, you are controlling the answer to this question in the minds of children. What is possible? The imagination becomes stifled at that point. If you can control what people believe or don't believe is possible, you have total control because you control the human imagination. So this was done through controlling books and what was printed in textbooks. And I'm going to explain who did that. If you control it from a level of books, you control the mind. Mind control is not science fiction, ladies and gentlemen. It's based upon the control of available information, which then determines our decision-making processes, which then determines our behavior, which then determines our reality. So, 
What this starts to sound like in the minds of people who are listening to me is, you're talking about a conspiracy, right? This is a conspiracy theory. Well, it's a conspiracy, but it's no theory, okay? People have been mind controlled to not even understand the real meaning of the term, the word conspiracy. They don't even know what the word means or where it came from. Okay, the conspiracy comes from the Latin language. Con in Latin is a prefix that means with or together. Okay? And then the second part of the word, spiracy, comes from the Latin verb spiro spirare, which means to breathe or to respire. Okay? And uh, of course, spirare is in turn derived from the Latin noun spiritus, meaning spirit. This is why when we're breathing, we're said to have spirit. We have life. We have spirit. When we stop breathing, we expire. The spirit leaves the body. Okay? So, with that definition in mind, a better understanding of the word conspiracy is simply this. Those who come together to do something in like spirit. The word literally means of like spirit. Okay? Those who are of the same mindset and the same spirit, sharing the same goals. That's all it means. Okay? So, who were the conspirators? Who conspired to keep Tesla's name out of the available information that was taught to children in schools? Well, we know this gentleman, most of us know this gentleman here, J.P. Morgan. We know his role, how he was connected with Tesla's life and work. So I'm not going to get into him that much today. I am going to talk about a couple of uh, Tesla's other financiers who financed his projects. Namely, Nathan Rothschild and other members of the Rothschild banking dynasty, and John Jacob Astor, who was another one of Tesla's funders. Okay? And then I'm going to talk about John D. Rockefeller and his connection with these other gentlemen, and how he and the Rockefeller family and dynasty ultimately ended up controlling publishing houses. Okay? This is what we need to understand to understand how Tesla's name was eradicated from human history, essentially. Not completely eradicated, but let's call it significantly marginalized. All right? Now, you'll notice that these men are, are, and their family bloodlines are some of the most influential people in the creation of some of the world's largest globalist think tanks. And what globalism really means is the centralization of power into fewer and fewer and fewer hands, all right? This is influenced by a lot of these think tanks that you see here. I'm gonna specifically talk about one of them, namely the Federal Reserve System, which isn't necessarily a think tank, it's a financial institution, okay? Which uh, the Rothschilds largely dominate and control. But again, these men here, Morgan, Astor, and Rockefeller, or what I would call, and many other researchers into the, this field of research would call agents of the Rothschild dynasty. Okay, this, this entrenched and foreign banking dynasty that ultimately controls the central banks of the world, including the Federal Reserve System here in the United States. Okay? There are also, again, uh, very influential people who uh, paved the way for things like the United Nations, the Royal Institute for International Affairs, the Council on Foreign Relations, which is right here in New York City, the Trilateral Commission, and the Bilderberg Group. Uh, I want to get into, specifically, again, Morgan's influence in, in changing um, his connection to the Rothschild dynasty and his influence in changing the way publishing houses printed information. And I'm going to talk about how influence, influencing the Rockefellers are in the modern day in this endeavor, in, in publishing of modern textbooks. Okay, so let's get into this. Again, these are globalists. You have to understand that's their mentality, that's their ideology. Therefore, the centralization of global power into fewer and fewer hands and always work through think tanks that support global government. So, part of the organization, as I've said, that worked with these, these gentlemen, that these gentlemen founded actually, okay, was the Federal Reserve System. Part of um, the research into this was the connection between the Morgans and the people who own the Federal Reserve System. And the Morgans are some of the owners of the Fed, 
the Morgans, the, uh, um, the, the Rothschilds, the, um, uh, the Schiffs, um, you know, many other influ influential financiers and bankers uh, in the early, uh, um, uh, late 19th and early 20th centuries. So this is part, of, this is an excerpt of a document that tried to track, it was actually commissioned by the House of Representatives, and it tried to track who owned the Federal Reserve System, because it's not a governmental institution, it's a private banking cartel. It says, chart one reveals the linear connection between the Rothschilds and the Bank of England and the London banking houses, which ultimately control the Federal Reserve banks through their stock holdings of bank stock and their subsidiary firms in New York. The two principal Rothschild representatives in New York, J.P. Morgan and Kuhn Loeb and Company, were the firms which set up the Jekyll Island Conference at which the Federal Reserve Act was drafted. They were who directed the subsequent successful campaign to have the plan enacted into law by Congress and who purchased the controlling amounts of stock in the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in 1914. We have been under the control of this central bank, which has devalued the currency of the United States for over 100 years now. Also in this document, it said that examination of the charts and text in the House Banking Committee staff report of August 1976 and the current stockholders list of the 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks show this same family control. The same family control. Rothschilds, Rockefellers, Morgans, Schiffs, and other high-level financiers and industrialists. Okay? So this came from a document called Who Owns the Federal Reserve, sourced from another document called Federal Reserve Directors, a study of corporate and banking influence, which was a staff report by the Committee on Banking, Currency, and Housing conducted by the House of Representatives, 94th Congress, second session, August 1976. This is a chart of what has happened in the United States dollar, to, to the purchasing power of the dollar since the Federal Reserve has taken over the issuance of our currency. Okay? So what they're doing is they're taking the United States from the inside. They're conquering it from the inside, essentially. That's who these men, these globalists, were. Okay? Not only did they marginalize Tesla's name from, name from history, but they're directly responsible for why the dollar buys nothing now compared to what it used to. Okay? And the, the debt slavery that has resulted as a result of the devaluation of our currency. All right. Now, going back to our globalist um, conspirators, I want to just briefly mention this gentleman here, John Jacob Astor, who was one of Tesla's funders. Astor started to challenge this banking cartel before, as it was rising to power. And he and other Astors didn't really want to go along with the devalue, this plan to devalue the United States currency and create debt slavery. Okay. Uh, not to say he wasn't a ruthless uh, industrialist and financier, but he, he didn't want the, the, the really top level dogs to con totally control the game and put everybody in, in, into debt slavery, okay? So when, he, when Astor started kind of being a little bit outspoken against this plan to take over America and the world through, through debt slavery, uh, does anybody know what happened to John Jacob Astor, what his fate was? He drowned aboard the Titanic, that's correct. Yes, okay? So we get a little more into possible conspiratorial realms that that may not have actually been an accident, quote unquote, all right? Uh, but another gentleman I wanna talk about is, of course, J.P. Morgan, his influence in the publishing house takeover in America to take it out of private family ownership, which was ultimately uh, involved in writing textbook and publishing, and bring it into corporate ownership. And of course, in the modern day, the Rockefeller family are the owners of the publishing houses. They own and control them all, essentially. Okay? So let's look at this dynamic a little bit. Throughout the 1890s, J.P. Morgan made many substantial loans to the Harper Brothers publishing houses, which were the big, pub it was the big publishing houses of the time. Morgan's involvement in the Harper firm started the shift away from private family ownership of publishing, publishing houses, first to private investors, and then to large corporations that began to dominate the publishing industry in the mid-20th century. 
Today, the Rockefeller family own and control three out of the big four school textbook publishing houses, including Simon & Schuster, HarperCollins, and Random House. The fourth is Pearson, who the Rockefeller family does not outright own, but they largely influence. Okay? The Rockefeller family also owns McGraw-Hill Publishing, Little Brown and Company, Macmillan Company, Viking Press, Saturday Review, Business Week, and Book of the Month Club, among many others. They totally dominate publishing. And they were agents of the Rothschilds and Morgans uh, during the time of the turn of the 20th century and leading right up into the 20th century and beyond. Okay? These globalists are who control those publishing houses. And what other industry do they control? Oil. They're the owners of big oil, okay? The, uh, when you think of the name Rockefeller, you think Standard Oil immediately, okay? So they have no interest, no interest whatsoever in a collapse of their dynastic wealth, okay, in favor of free energy technologies, you know? When Tesla told, pe told people he was going to light up the entire world and give it free energy free of charge. That's the last thing that these globalists wanted. The absolute last thing they wanted. Okay? So they did everything in their power not only to stop the technology from being manifested, but to wipe Tesla's name out in any way they could. And it's ultimately to maintain control over this planet. Because they do have control over this planet. They're the people who control Earth. Why do they control Earth? Very simply, they control energy. Everyone needs energy to live. And if people remember nothing else that I say here today, or accept nothing else that I say here today, understand this. The control of energy is the control of human beings. It's the control of people. That's what people have to understand about all of this. We're not talking about just the control of a controlled energy paradigm. We're talking about the control of human beings and what they need to live and survive. Or in other words, slavery. Let's just stop euphemizing. There's too many people who euphemize things and they don't want to call things what they really are. The control of energy is called slavery, okay? Whether anybody accepts that or not, that's what it is. And we need to stop euphemizing and say things the way they really are unapologetically. And that'll be my role. If no one else will do it, I will, okay? So most people, unfortunately, again, this may be uncomfortable for people to hear, most people in the free energy movement still don't understand the free part. They don't understand the free part of that equation. All right? They get, they get the energy part. They're very, very clear about that. But the free part, they have a hard time with. Okay? In two ways. Two ways I'm going to talk about that. Why do people not understand the free part? Their mind is under control. Their brain is in a cage, okay? And that is because of the available of availability of information that they are exposed to. They have not dug deep enough to, to go down, all the way down to that bottom level and really attain real knowledge, okay? So, what I'm talking about here is getting that mind out of the cage, really freeing the mind at a psychological and spiritual level is the only thing that's going to make free energy manifest. Only thing, nothing else. All right? Yeah. So let's, thank you. Let's, let's, let's look at what I call the two universal worldwide religions, false religions, that are actually holding humanity back from the manifestation of free energy. And until the mind grasps that these are illusions, that they don't exist in nature, that they don't really do anything except hold us back evolutionarily. There will be no change. Nothing will change here. Don't expect it. Don't count on it. Okay? The first universally believed in world false religion is called authority or government, call it whatever you want. It's authority. And it's a false religion, and here's what it actually is. It's not my belief about what it is, it's what it actually is. Okay? Authority is an illusion that is born out of mind control. It is based entirely in violence, and it is built upon the erroneous and dogmatic belief that some people are masters who have the moral right to issue commands, while other people are slaves who have a moral obligation to obey the masters. Now, I don't care whether you accept that or not. 
You can accept that or not accept it. No amount of not accepting it is ever going to make that statement untrue. That is eternal truth. Deal with it. Or don't. But it's true nonetheless. Okay? Now, authority in the old world worked like this, ladies and gentlemen. It was called the old world order. The old, and I put order in quotes because it was nothing of the kind. It was chaos. It was chaos then. It's chaos now. As long as it goes on, it will be chaos. Okay? The old world order worked like this. There was a king at the top. Unquestioned, unchallenged rule. His word was law. He was, a re he was the representative of God on the earth. No one could challenge his authority, quote unquote. This is called authority vested in one. The system is based entirely in violence, built upon the erroneous and dogmatic belief or religion that one person is the master who possesses the moral right to issue commands, while all others are subjects who have the moral obligation to obey the commands of the master. How does that differ from what we have today? Well, this is called the new world order. And again, I put order in quotes, because it's nothing of the kind. It's slavery and chaos, okay? What sits at the top now is called government. You've just taken this notion of authority and you've divested it into the hands of a few people who call themselves government, okay, and still claim the authority over other people to issue commands and called laws, and then they have the moral obligation to obey those laws, all right? So this is called authority vested in few. This system is based entirely in violence, built upon the erroneous and dogmatic belief or religion that a certain group of people are masters who possess the moral right to issue commands. All others are their, are their subjects who have a moral obligation to obey them. Now, there's a little equation that's left out of here that also ties in with the word free, and that's called money. Okay, because really what rules at the top of that pyramidal structure is a combination of government authority and corporate control. That wedding, that unholy union, is what's really controlling the world today. A marriage of government and corporate power, okay? That's what the new world order is, quote unquote order. Let's just look at how they compare the old world order with the king at the top. That's called, if we're being honest with ourselves and we stop euphemizing, that's called slavery ruled by one, okay? If we stop the euphemizing. All right. The new world order, on the other hand, is slavery ruled by few. Okay, and determined and dictated by the god called money. If we're being honest with ourselves, most people aren't. Most people lie to themselves every day from the minute they get up until the time that they fall asleep at night. But if we're being honest with ourselves, that's what that certainly is. That's what these two systems most certainly are. Okay. The other religion that humanity has to get past and stop believing in is this concept called money, which was given to us by our enslavers, by the way. Okay? It's a belief-based system of control built upon the fear of scarcity and purposefully designed to limit access to energy. You know, this whole mind-controlled notion that money is the medium of exchange, that it's somehow the store of value, this is nonsense. It's nonsense. It's not what money is, and that's not what it ever has been. It's always been a limiter, a control factor. That's all it is. And if something's controlled, it's not free. See, people think it's the flow. That's why they call it currency. Even, it's word magic. Even in the name, it's word magic. We'll call it currency, so you will liken it to current in an electrical system, a flow of energy. Nothing of the sort. N not true at all. Okay? Then people say, oh, wait, wait. It's the capacitance. It's the store of value, right? Like we store electricity in capacitors. No, it's not the store of value either. What is it? It's the resistance in the system. Money is the thing that stops energy from flowing freely. If we're being honest with ourselves, it's the resistance. If you're talking about DC, if you're talking about AC, it's the impotence, okay? That's what it really is. And uh, you know, the, the part that people don't get when it comes to freeing this technology is you got to give up the notion that you're going to be the one who owns it through, through the patent process. Let me tell you what the patent process is. It's a deal with the devil. 
It's a deal with the devil. Because you're taking that technology right to the government, right to the people who ultimately want to squash it so that they can maintain their petrodollar that they want to keep us in debt slavery to for eternity. You know, because this whole idea of uh, peak oil is also a myth. You know, and they know it. They know it. They'll, they'll keep this system running for tens of thousands of years if they can. All right? So the patent system is another, it's a cul-de-sac for control. That's all it is. It's getting them, how many free energy inventions do you think were killed by the patent system? 6,000. Uh, and probably more. That's probably the ones we know about, Russell. That's right. That's right. Okay? So before people get ahead of themselves and think we're going to bring all the Tesla technology to fruition, and guess what? I'm the, I'm the number one advocate of that. I'm the number one proponent of that, an enthusiast of that. I think that the world needs that above many, many other things, okay? But if we think we're going to bring Tesla's visionary technology to fruition within a state of slavery, we're lying to ourselves. We're kidding ourselves, okay? We have to stop trying to put the cart before the horse, okay? You can't put the cart before the horse, okay? People think, what, what the free energy movement seems to think is that Tesla technology is the horse, and it's gonna bring in freedom in the cart into our culture. Freedom's riding in that cart, and it's, that, Tesla technology is that horse, it's gonna pull it in, and every, we're gonna magically be free once we develop that. Well, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, but to burst the bubble on that, ladies and gentlemen, but it's the other way around. It's exactly the other way around, okay? Tesla technology's in that cart, and the horse is true freedom, an understanding of what true freedom is, living in harmony with natural law, the laws of morality, have to come first to usher in an era of true freedom, and then the Tesla technology will be pulled in. Not a moment until. There can be, can be, no free energy in an ongoing state of slavery. Slavery must be ended first before free energy can ever be manifested. Thank you. Now, what I'm really talking about here is a paradigm shift, okay? It's a paradigm shift in the mind, and the, the religions of money and authority have to be completely abandoned. They have to be completely abandoned before that new manifestation of free energy can occur, okay? Free energy can only manifest as a natural consequence of universal spiritual enlightenment, and that enlightenment contrary to what many people will tell you, is, by definition, the abandonment of these false religions of authority and money. That's what enlightenment is, contrary to what the New Age movement will tell people that it is. That's what it really is, okay? And I think the key ultimately lies in the mind of each one of us, in getting out of illusory notions that we stubbornly cling on to because we believe these things are necessary. They're not necessary, they never have been necessary, they never will be necessary. These are the control system factors that ultimately hold us back from true evolutionary development, from true evolutionary progress as a species. And I think if Tesla were here today, he would tell us about the importance of freeing our minds. He would, he would advocate that we really need to do one thing in mass as a species if we are ever going to see his most brilliant and visionary technologies implemented, and that is this, to end slavery. When we do that, and not a moment before, we will see a new world, truly a new world born that is a world of order and peace and prosperity, and most importantly, freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your kind attention.